Good morning and welcome to St. Bartol's for this short act of worship. Today is the third Sunday of Epiphany. We begin with the Collect, the special prayer for the day. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son revealed in signs and miracles the wonder of your saving presence, renew your people with your heavenly grace and in all our weakness, sustain us by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 14, verses 17 to 20. Genesis 14, verses 17 to 20. After Abram's return from the defeat of Kedoleoma and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. And King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him one-tenth of everything. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm appointed is Psalm 128, the response to the psalm. Whoever fears the Lord shall indeed be blessed. Whoever fears the Lord shall indeed be blessed. Happy are they all who fear the Lord and who follow in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of your labour. Happiness and prosperity shall be yours. Whoever fears the Lord shall indeed be blessed. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house, your children like olive shoots round about your table. Whoever fears the Lord shall thus indeed be blessed. Whoever fears the Lord shall indeed be blessed. The Lord bless you from Zion, and may you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you live to see your children's children. May peace be upon Israel. Whoever fears the Lord shall indeed be blessed. The New Testament reading is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 6 to 10. Revelation 19, verses 6 to 10. I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty thunder peals, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. To her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your comrades who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, Alleluia. Christ was revealed in flesh, proclaimed among the nations, and believed in throughout the world. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. And it's John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. There was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out, and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the, serv the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Don't we all love a good wedding? The happy couple, the excuse to dress up rather grandly, the bride's elaborate dress, the bridal chorus and the wedding march, the confetti, the boring vicar droning on in a language that no one understands, and so on. And then, of course, there's the reception, the speeches, the dancing, or something vaguely resembling dancing, lots and lots of grub on the venue, on the menu, and last but not least, the booze, and plenty of supplies of it at that. It all makes for a really memorable occasion. Now, if you enjoy going to weddings, then you'd be pleased to be reminded of the fact that nuptial or marriage imagery is to be found throughout the pages of God's Word. At the very beginning of the Bible, the first two chapters of Genesis climax in the creation of man and woman in God's image and the bodily union of husband and wife. A man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And at the other end of the Bible, in the final two chapters of Revelation, the new Jerusalem is unveiled, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
and in between weddings occur at significant moments in the story of God and his people, Isaac and Rebekah, Ruth and Boaz, and so on and so on. God celebrates marriage. So it's perhaps unsurprising that the first of the signs of Jesus' glory in the Gospel of John is in the context of a wedding. Indeed, his presence lifts the party to new heights. Jesus had been invited to the wedding, possibly through a link with the family of the bride and groom. In fact, it seems that his mother Mary had some involvement in the catering arrangements. Unlike our present-day wedding celebrations, which usually last no more than an afternoon and evening, in first century Jewish society, they were long drawn out affairs, sometimes going on for as long as a week. Now that's a lot of grub and booze we're talking about. So it's probably not unexpected that there was a real risk that they could run out of wine. And that's just what happened in this case. Now for us today, this would not be a big deal at all. Someone would merely go down to the local 24-hour Tesco and raid the shelves of the alcoholic drink aisles accordingly. But it wasn't so straightforward 2,000 years ago. What's more, running out of wine at a wedding feast would have been seen as more than just a slight embarrassment. It was a serious social faux pas. This is the kind of thing that really shouldn't happen. All those guests sitting there with no liquid to wet their tongues. It was a complete catastrophe, which would have reflected really badly on the bridegroom himself. And so in the midst of this situation, Mary asked Jesus if he can do something about it. No doubt, over the years, she had got used to turning to her eldest son in time of need, especially if her husband Joseph had already passed away. It might seem from his initial response to his mother's request that Jesus was reluctant to get involved in the matter. As he says, his hour had not yet come. Thus to say, his glory would indeed be fully revealed on the cross the climax of his ministry. But was this situation perhaps a distraction from, from the real focus of the mission for which the Father had sent him into the world? Mary's request perhaps also reflects a misunderstanding on her part at this stage about the true nature of her son's calling as Messiah, as were the expectations of many in Israel at the time People were looking for quick fixes. A Messiah who would come along as a great political and military leader who would restore the fortunes of their nation. But Mary would have to wait until she found herself at the foot of the cross as the sorrowing mother, the Mater Dolorosa, in order to truly understand. Nonetheless, on this occasion, when Mary puts her faith in him, her faith is honoured. So Jesus directs the servants to fill up to the brim the six water jars, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. This in itself gives some indication of the magnitude of the miracle which Jesus was about to perform. And when the servants draw out some of the water which had by now miraculously turned into wine and hand it over to the chief steward, he expresses surprise at the quality of the new wine compared to what had been served earlier. In doing so, Jesus had reversed the usual custom by bringing out the quality wine well into the celebration after most of the guests were probably already worse for wear and would no longer have had any appreciation of what was going past their lips. So, at a very practical level, Jesus simply saved the day. 
and his provision of the new wine was like a wedding gift to the couple, thus fulfilling his obligations as a wedding guest. And what an amazing present indeed. And by the way, what this incident is not about is giving us a green light to indulge in excessive alcohol consumption. It's got nothing to do with that. Alcohol abuse can profoundly damage people's lives. But what was Jesus' miracle really all about? Well, the author of the Gospel refers to Jesus' turning of the water into wine as a sign. Now, the purpose of a sign is to point beyond itself to something else. And in this case, the miracle is a sign pointing to who Jesus really is. In the well-known words of the prologue to John's Gospel, it declares, We have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. And so here in this miraculous event, the true glory of the Son of God is revealed, both in his ability to change water into wine and in his grace in providing an abundance of quality wine to spare the bridegroom huge embarrassment. So in response to witnessing this sign, Jesus' disciples put their faith, their trust in him. In fact, during the course of the account of the wedding at Cana, we see a couple of examples of people putting their faith in Jesus and showing obedience to him. The first, of course, is Mary. In commanding the servants, do whatever he, Jesus, tells you. She was demonstrating real faith in her son, that he could indeed transform the situation. In fact, her reaction is something of a model for intercessory prayer. Rather than telling Jesus what she expects him to do, she simply lays the need before Jesus and trusts him to respond as he wills. In the same way, when we engage in prayer, do we simply lay our needs before the Lord, trusting that he knows how best to respond to our needs? Or do we tend to dictate to him, expecting him to respond as we want him to? The thing is, if we have committed our lives to Christ, we ought not to be seeking to do things my way, but rather to allow his will to be done in all things. The other example is that provided by the servants. Their unquestioning obedience and their faith in Jesus' word played an important part in the miracle. They did what Jesus said, even though they didn't know what was going to happen. For all they knew, they could have taken the cup to the chief steward, only for it still to be water. But no, they placed their trust in the Lord, and they too witnessed his glory revealed in their midst. In the same way, do we have faith? that Jesus can transform our lives and the situations we face. And when we dig a bit deeper, we find even more significance behind this miracle. It's probably no mere detail that the Gospel writer notes that the stone jars holding the water were used for the Jewish rites of purification. The Jewish law required that people had to ceremonially wash their hands before eating meals, and the vessels used also had to be cleaned. Now this wasn't simply about good hygiene, but about ritual purity. 
In a sense, the water jars represented all the rules and regulations and rituals of Judaism. By contrast, Jesus brought the new wine of the kingdom of God. Just as the water was turned into wine, and a wine far superior to what they had before, so what Jesus brings is far superior to the old wine of the old religion. In the coming of Jesus, God has indeed kept the best wine until now. And this is clear in two ways. Firstly, when it came to being made pure in God's sight, the Jewish law with its rituals and ceremonials could only point the way, but it could give no relief to those whose consciences were burdened by sin. Cleansing rituals could never truly remove sin. You could wash your hands over and over again, but it did nothing to bring complete cleansing from sin. By contrast, through his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him. He is the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. And secondly, the old Jewish practices about purification could point people to the way of holiness, but could not in themselves make people holy. By contrast, Christ has brought the new covenant in which we are given a new, a changed heart. As Jeremiah had prophesied many centuries earlier, under the new covenant, God will put his law within us and will write it on our hearts. So if we are in Christ, we are a new creature, a new creation. We are empowered to live a holy life through the Holy Spirit working in our lives. When we come to worship, there are various rituals and ceremonies which we usually engage in. These things in themselves, though, are powerless to take away our sin. It's only by putting our trust in Christ and in his saving death on the cross that we can truly know our sins forgiven. And neither can those rituals and ceremonies in themselves make us any more holy. It's only when we allow the new wine of the Holy Spirit to enter into our lives that we can be truly transformed into the people God wants us to be. And then in turn others will be able to see the glory of Christ reflected in and through our lives. Now all this talk of the Lord's presence at a, at a wedding feast perhaps has echoes for us of Holy Communion at which Christ's presence among us makes the feast. It's a banquet which is symbolically anticipated towards the beginning of Israel's history as God's chosen people when Abraham encounters Melchizedek, king of Salem and priest of God Most High, and who brings out bread and wine. And then in our passage from Revelation, at the very end of time, we read of another wedding, this time the marriage of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and his bride, the Church culminating in the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's a feast which our sharing in bread and wine, the body and blood of Christ, is but a foretaste. So, just as Jesus turned the water into wine at the wedding at Cana, 
To what extent have we allowed him to transform our lives? As Bishop Tom Wright so wonderfully puts it, when we leave church or rise from prayer, would people mistake us for wedding guests, for party goers? Why not? Did we do whatever he tells us? Did we see his glory and believe? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that through your Son's sacrifice made once for all upon the cross, we are truly cleansed from sin and reconciled to you. Help us to put our trust in you, that your will may be done in all things, and transform us by your Spirit, that we may be living temples to your glory. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And to a concluding prayer and the blessing, let us pray. Almighty Father, whose Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, May your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, shine with the radiance of his glory, that he may be known, worshipped and obeyed to the ends of the earth, for he is alive and reigns now and forever. Amen. Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.